Good morning, and welcome to Morning Movie News, where for the first story of the day, I have what one would think would be breaking news, and that's the Russo brothers have revealed three of the four actors who were doing the voices for the uh, Black Order, Thanos' uh, goons in Avengers Infinity War. This has been one of the most hotly anticipated reveals for the movie, along with Who Will Die? Uh, but it turns out it's a little bit of a letdown, uh, and that's why it's not getting its own video on the main Beyond the Trailer channel, and why it's not being shouted from the rooftops on the internets, right? Uh, because they, they seem to have punted instead of swung for the fences. So again, as I, well, I, I, I'm going to address the rumor that was going around a couple of weeks ago, which I thought was stupid when I heard it, but now I'm like, ah, those were the days. <laughs> but let's first go over who actually is doing three of the four voices. Uh, the only one that hasn't been revealed yet is Corvus Glaive, who I'm thinking must be Peter Dinklage because uh, he's in the cast list for the movie, um, but we haven't seen him filming. N nothing's been said about who he's playing or we, have, we haven't seen him in any behind the scenes footage uh, and he has such an amazing voice. So uh, I thought he'd be voicing Ebony Maw because that seems like a better fit for him, you know, as an actor, but I guess it's Corvus Glaive. And he's the leader of the Black Order, so uh, I guess that character's got that going for it, but I think it's going to be the less showy role. But maybe I'm wrong. Peter Dinklage is a very good voice actor. Um, better than, better I think than the people who who are joining him in the Black Order. But so so let's let's talk about that. So the biggest name that's been revealed, that's been confirmed, is Carrie Coon, who many of you know from The Leftovers, also uh, the latest season of Fargo, the only season of Fargo that I could not watch, uh, the one with um, Ewan McGregor, and I love Ewan McGregor. That's how bad it was. Uh, and she also played uh, Ben Affleck's sister in Gone Girl. And she will voice, obviously, uh, Proxima Midnight. Then, as for the other two uh, actor actors, remember it was like, oh, I was, we talked about this. Isn't it weird that some other actor did the motion capture for these roles? Wouldn't you think that the actor that eventually does their voice would want to do the motion capture? Well, it turns out that those actors we saw on set are the actors who are doing the voices, and they're Irish actors. Uh, Tom Vaughn uh, Loyler, Loyler is going to do Ebony Ma, although I think with all due respect to him, that's the best, that's the one or member of the Black Order we've seen gotten a really good shot at in the trailers. It looked pretty good there, actually. So maybe, maybe I'll become a Tom Vaughn uh, Loyler fan. And any of you who are familiar with these Irish actors, please tell us if you think they're any good. Uh, and then Terry Notary is voicing Cull Obsidian. Uh, I think this is a missed opportunity. I mean, these are just real, like, meh voice, voice actors. It almost makes me feel like they don't say very much, except for maybe, maybe Corvus Glaive. So they were like, we can't get anybody bigger because they don't, they don't have a lot of lines. And you're like, why would you do that? I mean, I, I'm really counting on the Black Order to like really help move Marvel villains to the next level, hopefully. Like, like they mean business, right? Uh, that would be the ideal situation. Although maybe, maybe that's not going to be the case. I also love to point out how much they're similar to the new gods, you know, Thanos and his Black Order, uh, with, with Marvel undercutting the DCEU every chance they get. Uh, but remember the rumor was that Whoopi Goldberg was going to voice Proxima Midnight and Mark Hamill, Corvus Glaive, and uh, Bill Nye, Ebony Ma, and then Vin Diesel, already in the recording booth for Groot, would do Call Obsidian. I, first of all, I didn't think this was true because I thought, well, again, I thought I knew Peter Dinklage was going to be voicing one of the characters, so I was like, he's not in your list, so I don't believe this list. Uh, also, Vin Diesel, they wouldn't have him voice two characters. I just don't see Marvel doing that. Uh, and, you know, there was like um, a nice synergy that Mark Hamill and Whoopi Goldberg have strong Disney ties. And so does Bill Nye, you know, being in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. So it all seemed to, you know, uh, for those of you who are like, what does Whoopi Goldberg do with Disney? Well, she not only did a voice of one of the hyenas in the original Lion King animated movie a while, a while ago, uh, but she's also, of course, the, the top uh, host on The View, which airs on ABC. So synergy. Uh, but, but I just didn't think Whoopi Goldberg seemed like a great fit uh, with Proxima Midnight. You know, you, 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 you think as a fan, you'll feel it in your gut when you hear it. You're like, that's a match, right? With Whoopi Goldberg as Proxima Midnight, I'm, I, I was like, I, I just don't have that feeling of like, that's the casting. But I think she's a more interesting choice than Carrie Coon. We'll see what Carrie Coon does with the role. We'll see how much Proxima Midnight actually says. But what do you think of this reveal? Do you think Peter Dinklage can save the Black Order? Uh, and do you agree with me that this is a little bit of a missed opportunity? And how will you feel if the Black Order is largely silent? Hmm, very interesting. And then again, I did like what I saw of Ebony Ma so far, so maybe Tom Von Loyler is a great pick.
All right, so that's the first story of the day. I can't believe it doesn't warrant, warrant its own video. So ridiculous. All right, so the second story of the day is that all the time, particularly in the wake of Wonder Woman and Black Panther, I get asked by a number of you, well, when are we going to get representation for Latino and Asian audiences? Asian audiences, I feel your day is coming. There's a lot of stuff happening uh, uh, driven by the popularity of um, the Asian box office, how much money it can uh, generate. So you're seeing a lot of uh, movement there, like the Mulan movie that's coming together. It might not be good because of all the changes they're making, but hey, um, there's certainly going to be a lot of Asian talent on screen. But then, uh, um, late uh, last week, the Latino audience got a major boost from the Terminator franchise. And some of you might be like, whoa, some kind of help is the kind of help we don't want, right? Because the Terminator franchise has, of course, been suffering. But this is the one we're all hopeful for because James Cameron is returning and he's making this movie with uh, Tim Miller being the actual director. James Cameron will help with the writing and he's going to be producing. So anyway, they finally have revealed who will be joining Mackenzie Davis from Blade Runner 2049 as a new character, and then also Arnold Schwarzenegger and Linda Hamilton in the movie. Although it's said that Schwarzenegger and Hamilton have very small roles, which maybe is for the best. But I'm not sure about this. So let me tell you what's going on, and you tell me what you think, all right? So the new Terminator will be played by Gabriel Luna, who most uh, American audiences know from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as the new Ghost Rider, Robbie Re uh, Reyes. Uh, and many of you say you love Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., so maybe this is great casting. And for those of you, I know many of you are watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., what do you think of Gabriel Luna? So he's going to be the new Terminator. Uh, and then Diego Bonetta from Scream Queens will also be in the movie. And then the big find, the lead of the film, will be a Colombian actress. They did a huge global casting search. They came up with this woman, Natalia Reyes, um, who will play a, work, a, a girl in a working class neighborhood in Mexico City who finds herself caught in a battle between humans and machines. Hmm, Mexico City. Interesting choice for the location of this film. Mexico City is a pretty brutal place, so I think that could be pretty interesting, you know, commentary there. And if they could do something along the lines of Sicario, where the Mexico stuff was amazing, then maybe I could, maybe I could see this really working out quite well. Uh, and also, I love the representation of Diego Luna in Rogue One. He did a great job. I loved, I loved his work in the film, all on its own. And then what it meant to a number of people, as we've discussed before, uh, I thought was really touching. And I have a lot of faith in James Cameron. Uh, the guy really knows what he's doing. I mean, he has still to this day the two highest grossing films of all time. Although people, other movies are starting to get close, but still, he's the record holder for now. Uh, and then also, I have tremendous faith in Tim Miller's ability to direct the hell out of action sequences. So this movie should look great. But while I love seeing the representation, I'm concerned about there being two TV actors in this movie, Gabriel Luna and Diego Bonetta. I think that's a very, you know, it's, it's a choice that concerns me, let's say, right? However, this could just speak to the lack of roles for Latino talent in Hollywood, and this is the best these actors could get. And now they're finally getting a legit chance to prove themselves in a major franchise. So we'll see. I'm curious if you're familiar with any of these people's work. What do you think? Uh, and how do you, does this, you know, if you're not, how, do you, how does this make you feel about the upcoming Terminator movie? I mean, again, Cameron and Miller is too good a team to pass up behind the camera, so I'm hopeful that they made good choices for in front of the camera. All right, so that's the second story of the day. Now, the third story of the day is about the Cannes Film Festival, which is coming up very quickly, May 8th to the 19th. But most of the news is focused on uh, Cannes saying that Netflix movies cannot compete uh, at the festival unless they have a, a secured distribution in France uh, and then Netflix saying well then we're skipping your festival entirely because you can show films that can out of competition like the solo you know the Han Solo movie which is going to um, debut there I believe uh, May 10th is the date uh, so you know can was hoping to have its cake and eat it too right to be like you can't complete net compete Netflix but we'd love to have you walk the red carpet and bring attention you know to our to our festival but Netflix said no thank you however they did release the films that will be competing, and I think it's, it's worth uh, discussing because I think this is an opportunity for two actors in particular who need it to really shine. So only two movies, um, you know, Solo is playing, but again, outside of competition. Well, it's not just playing, it's premiering. But two other, uh, two, only two Hollywood films will be in competition. So one is Spike Lee and Jordan Peele's Black Klansman. I'm very excited about this movie, uh, you know, not just because of the talent involved, uh, but because of the story. It's very interesting. Uh, everybody's been hoping, you know, a lot of times we feel like Hollywood, especially when it comes to awards films, keeps telling the same stories. Uh, and it seems like maybe we're going to start to get some new ones, which is very exciting, obviously, right? 
Uh, sorry, I had a, a window that was kept reloading and distracting me. Uh, so anyway, um, I'm very excited about this movie, and it's uh, about uh, an undercover police officer who, in the you know black, back when the uh, the KKK was a big well a big problem, you know very. Um, uh, well-known problem in the United States uh, and he infiltrated the KKK and actually managed to work his way up to leading a chapter you know as a black man an open black man so that's uh, gonna be I think a very interesting story indeed and it's a true story it stars Denzel Washington's son John David Washington who many of you I uh, know from Ballers uh, Dwayne Johnson's HBO show uh, and then also Adam Driver co-stars so this is a chance for both of those actors but I think particularly John David Washington to make their mark. And then the other film is Under the Silver Lake from uh, It Follows director David Robert Mitchell, finally his follow-up, and that of course stars Andrew Garfield. We saw the trailer uh, um, a couple of weeks ago. And Topher Grace, by the way, is both those movies. So he might get some attention as well. But I think this is very exciting for both uh, John David Washington and, and Andrew Garfield uh, and their movies to really get a big PR boost in terms of both audience interest and media interest and also traction for the upcoming awards season. So very exciting. I think Cannes is shaping up okay, uh, okay, and we'll see if the Netflix boycott does indeed hurt them. I don't know. Netflix's movies aren't they don't get that much attention anyway, so I don't know how much leverage Netflix really has in that argument. All right, so those are the three stories of the day. Now, the viewer question comes from Cutting Edge, and Cutting Edge says, Hi, Grace, viewer question. Can you discuss how box office predictions are made before a movie opens? With the pre-sales, pre-release ticket sales for Infinity War being so high, I'm sure you've seen the headlines, I have, uh, about it outselling the seven most recent MCU movies combined. I'm surprised that the opening weekend prediction is just 175 to 200 million. I'm sure there are other factors that go into that prediction, though, and I'd love, I'd be interested in learning what they are. Oh, you're such an articulate uh, viewer question here, Cutting Edge. I love it. Love your videos for your great insight and enthusiastic personality. Thanks for making great content. Aw, thank you. You're welcome. I'm so pleased to do it. I love talking movies with you guys. So great question. Now that um, tra that, that tracking, that uh, projected opening weekend is a bit low. Uh, I think 215 um, and then most recently 235 is where some people are pegging it. It's coming awfully close to The Force Awakens, the biggest opening of all time at 247. But anyway, let me tell you the factors that go in to deciding what you know, pro projecting not just where a movie will open, but what it will potentially make overall. So of course, pre-sales are a part of that. Uh, but then also, Hollywood does something called tracking, and they'll, you know, it's just like how they pull some moviegoers. I'm sure many of you are like, I've never been asked. Have you ever been asked about who you're voting for? But yet those polls still show up on the news all the time. You know, they do a small uh, focus group, at, you know, and they apply that to the whole population and some usually they keep doing it because for the most part they're right uh, although of course uh, political polling for instance uh, really had some problems in the last presidential election but anyway so they they poll moviegoers about upcoming movies as well and they say what movies are you looking forward to what movies are on the horizon you see fandango do this too but hollywood has internal polls that they do they're like uh, companies do this and they provide it to the studios and then they say with movies that are coming up they ask how interested are you in seeing this movie you're definitely going to see it you're considering seeing it you probably are not going to see it and you're definitely not going to see it so th those are the those that's how detailed the report is so that's something else that is factored in then also, now they've started to pay attention, as I'm sure you've noticed, to social media chatter. Uh, you see this reported sometimes in box office reports, you know, uh, or, you know, sometimes for upcoming and then also after it happened. What, how many people were tweeting about it? What were the Instagram posts? What were the mentions? That's very important. They factor that in. Also, trailer views. How well has the trailer been doing? Uh, sometimes that's incorrect as well. We've seen some really popular trailers that don't result in a particularly successful film, although that doesn't happen so much anymore. Uh, so trailer views is obviously a big part. And then also, similar, you know, previous similar films. It's amazing, as we've discussed before, how consistent audiences are in what they go to see. As I've said many times, for the most part, Ryan Gosling movies always open around 11 million. It's weird, but only about 11 million people are interested in what Ryan Gosling is doing. Uh, and, it, uh, you know, occasionally, there, you know, there's always deviations from the norm, positive and negative. But, you know, there's a set audience that's interested and the name of the game is to potentially get more people interested and you don't want to you know dissuade people who were interested right but there's that sweet spot x number of people are interested in comic book movies right but the reason black panther did better for instance is because it reached out to a certain demographic um you know african-american moviegoers particularly here in the united states and that was able to up those numbers right but marvel movies have a certain number of people who are always going to see them opening weekend so hollywood can kind of discern that by looking at the previous uh box office numbers 
numbers. So that's also how it's done, uh, and including how far how, how a movie will do in its overall run as well by looking at those uh, past movies. Because again, we're creatures of habit, and for the most part, with movie going people don't really break that. And just for instance, the type of moviegoer there is. There's the moviegoer who goes every single weekend and is always looking for a movie to see. And then there's the moviegoer who goes maybe once a month and has to be persuaded to see your movie. And then there are sometimes moviegoers who go only a couple of times a year and they have to be persuaded to go to the movies at all. So it's a very interesting situation. But don't worry, Hollywood's on top of it and they are paying very close attention, particularly as they have more uh, other entertainment outlets competing for your time, uh, like streaming, etc. So great question, Cutting Edge. So I, I hope that gives you a little bit more of an insight into, uh, into how those predictions are made. Uh, thank you for, again for your question. Thank you everybody for tuning in today. Please write down below think today's top three stories, Cutting Edge's viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, and of course, any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.